Hey friends, I hope you're all having a healthy and happy day today. My name is Tara and this is my channel, True Crime Matters, where we talk about and analyze everything true crime. If you haven't already, please take a second to subscribe. It's just a free and easy way to help support the channel and I'd be super grateful for that. I also wanted to mention that we have just started a TikTok under True Crime Matter. That's just True Crime Matter without the S at the end. You'll see it has my photo on the page and I'll link it down below. We're also on Insta and Facebook now, so feel free to like and follow us on those platforms as well, especially with Facebook because we're trying to showcase some missing people cases and get the word out. So if you'd like to hop on there and share some of those missing people stories to help support the families of those who are missing, it would be greatly appreciated by everybody. Now, we have to talk about some Scott Peterson news. I know, I know, uh, many of you have been asking where the hell part two and part three are of my very first video post, and trust me, it is coming. But part of the issue is that I still work full time at a nonprofit job, and I'm a single mom of two little kids, so I'm trying to spread out my coverage of cases to catch them while they're still happening. You may notice if you go to my TikTok, you'll see that we've been covering the Lori Vallow trial. I've also been covering upcoming cases like the Sarah Boone suitcase murder and the University of Idaho murder. So I promise that we will get there. I have so much passion for true crime that I've finally gotten over my fear of speaking in front of the camera. I actually have a degree in broadcast journalism, which I have never formally used. So this is great that I'm finally using it. Anyway, I'm going to skip over part two and part three of the Scott Peterson story in order to get this Scott Peterson news out. For those of you who don't know about the Scott Peterson case, please feel free to go back and watch my part one of the case. Scott's pregnant wife, Lacey, went missing on Christmas Eve of 2002, and Scott was under immediate police suspicion the moment that he called Lacey's mother to ask if Lacey was with them. Apparently, when Scott arrived home, he noticed the door was unlocked and Lacey's car was there, but Lacey was not home. Scott said he had gone fishing that day in San Francisco Bay, which everybody found super suspicious, even though Lacey's stepfather had also gone fishing that same day. It was later discovered that Scott was having a new five-week-long affair with a single mom named Amber Frey, further increasing suspicion that Scott killed Lacey. We had investigated pretty much all of the likely leads, and we were just still working it as an no-body case at that time. 11.43 a.m. this morning, a little bit before 12 o'clock, we got the report from a dog walker of a pretty badly decomposed body. We believe the gender of the victim is female. Hey, Joe. Brother, what's up? I lost him and another set got me. Oh, brother. I don't think I should come play golf. I think I want to picture me in the press. Like, oh, yeah. He thought he was being followed by media, but it turned out they were law enforcement. I was tired of being hunted by the media. I, mean, I tried to lose it. I drove for a long time. At least over an hour. I flipped him off a few times because I thought they were media. I drove kind of crazy just trying to get away from him. And I finally gave up. I didn't stop driving for a golf course so I could be with my family. All of a sudden, probably the best year, cars behind me turned on the light, and suddenly I knew that it was actually clear. We're getting to the desk so late at night, I don't know, maybe 11 p.m. or something. There was a mob gathered outside the downtown jail. Look at this, all the people who have gathered to catch a glimpse of Peterson as he was driven here from San Diego by detectives. He was convicted in the public's eye long before we hit the trial. Mr. Peterson, is the calcification your true answer? Yes, sir. He said, I'm not guilty, Your Honor. Because enormous media coverage may have tainted the Modesto jury pool, the trial will be held in Redwood City. When I heard it was going to Redwood City, I thought, whoa, only 50 minutes away. That's not far enough. 
We went from trying to find people who are willing to consider that Scott Peterson could be innocent. We couldn't find many of those. Then we started going, can we just find people who are willing to say they'll give him a fair trial? Uh, and even that was difficult to find. Do you feel like you can get a fair trial with all that publicity? I hope so. The question really is, in that atmosphere, could any defense attorney pick a fair jury for Scott? Prosecutors in Scott Peterson's murder trial are hoping to get their case back on track. Last week, a key prosecution witness instead delivered some damaging testimony, and a juror who was dismissed from the trial was critical of the prosecution's case against Peterson. I hate to say it, but I keep being very negative because I've never seen prosecutors bumble things as much, especially in a national celebrity case, or not celebrity, but a national case. Jurors begin their first full day of deliberations in the Scott Peterson case today. There's no indication how long this jury will be out. The stakes, of course, are huge. Courtroom observers are divided on which way they're going to go. Jurors in Scott Peterson's murder trial are going back to the beginning today. The jury was instructed to begin new deliberations after the foreman and another panel member were removed from the case earlier this week. We're told there's a major development in the Scott Peterson case. There is a verdict in the Scott Peterson trial, and it will be announced at 1 p.m. Pacific time. As you can see behind me, a group of spectators has gathered already at the courthouse. It is starting to sort of pick up here. This was empty uh, only half an hour ago. We, the jury, in the above entitled cause, find the defendant, Scott Lee Peterson, guilty of the crime of murder of Lacey Denise Peterson. We, the jury, in the above entitled cause, find the defendant, Scott Lee Peterson, guilty of the crime of murder of baby Connor Peterson. Just like this amazing, horrible physical reaction that I had. Everything just went kind of silent or I couldn't hear anything. I guess the static would be the way to describe it in my ears. I couldn't feel anything. I couldn't feel my feet on the floor. I couldn't feel the chair I was sitting in. My vision was even a little blurry. And I just had this weird sensation that uh, I was falling forward and forward and down. And there was going to be no end to this falling forward and down. Like there was no floor to land on. I, mean, I, I was staggered by it. I had no idea it was coming. It has just come out, though, that Scott Peterson has just filed an appeal with the First District Court of Appeals. Now, the court did not deny the appeal. On the contrary, they notably gave the state just 30 days to respond to the petition, which apparently isn't really all that common. I read that the court could have just denied the appeal and... Also, they typically don't give a time frame in which the state has to respond. So it's definitely pretty interesting that the court gave the state just 30 days to respond. The petition said new evidence is of such decisive force and value that it would more than likely than not change the outcome of the trial. Then the petition went on to list six key issues that either the attorney general or the district attorney is being asked to respond to. The six issues are as follows. Number one, a renewed claim of juror misconduct by juror number seven. Now, if you don't know this, a few months back, a California judge was determining if juror number seven, Rochelle Neese, was bias at trial. Peterson alleged that the juror lied about her own history to get on the panel that initially sent him to death row. And I'll just take a moment. Manriquez was a relatively recent 2018 decision of the Supreme Court, where the Supreme Court talked about how a, quote, a juror who conceals relevant facts or gives false answers during a voir dire examination undermines jury selection and commits misconduct. And then they went on to say such misconduct includes the unintentional concealment that is, the inadvertent non-disclosure of facts. But let's say, for example, a juror gives a false answer and it's unintentional. We know from Boyette, we know from Enriquez, and we know from Cowan that that's still misconduct. That's why each of those cases found unintentional false answers, but they went on to uh, impose a presumption, of correct, a presumption of prejudice, and they resolved the case by analyzing whether, in fact, the state had rebutted the presumption. I want to focus today on two questions in the questionnaire. Questions 54 and question 74. 
Question 54 was the question that asked, uh, have you ever been involved in a lawsuit? And Ms. Nice answered in the questionnaire, no, I haven't. And in fact, we now know that that was false, that she was involved in two lawsuits, a restraining order lawsuit in 2000 and a civil damages lawsuit uh, sometime thereafter. <clears throat> How do we know? We know because Ms. Nice has told us. Exhibit one of the, of the exhibits that were introduced, Your Honor, is the paperwork for the restraining order litigation in November of 2000 and December of 2000. In the recent hearings from last year, it came out that this juror in her juror questionnaire responded no to whether or not she could look at the evidence with non-biased, fresh eyes, ignoring what she had heard in the news. As in, no, I cannot look at this trial evidence fairly. Now, I was watching this hearing and I found that absolutely mind-blowing that this woman was admitting up front that she could not be fair, yet she was allowed on the jury. In the hearing, the judge actually asked a follow-up question about this because then why was this juror selected to be on the jury by the defense? Like, how does that even happen? Okay, so let me go back to the jury questionnaire 97A. Um, I'm sorry, Your Honor, I don't have 97A. That's all right, I'll read it to you. Oh, thanks. The jurors that sit on this case will be instructed that they must base their decision entirely on the evidence produced in court, comma, not from any outside or pre-existing opinion or attitudes. Can you do that despite what you have read, heard, or seen about this case? She checked no. She did. Any follow-up on that from Mr. Garagos? I, I don't recall. I assume the parties thought it was a mistake, uh, but I don't know. It seems uh, astonishing to me, Your Honor. It seems uh, absolutely consistent with the idea that she had some kind of predetermined uh, bias in the case and she was talking about it there, but I don't believe there's any follow-up on it. Well, but isn't that pretty important to follow up? I, I mean, the whole reason for these questionnaires is for the attorneys to look at answers carefully and follow up and say, you know, I noticed you've given all these answers right now but I noticed on 97A, you checked no. Ms. Nice, or juror number seven at the time. Yes. Was that a mistake? Can you explain? Isn't that what attorneys are supposed to do? I agree, I completely, Your Honor. Okay, all right. I was, I was not there, Your Honor, but I, I agree completely with your assessment. Okay. Okay. The second problem with the juror, Peterson claimed, is that she flat out lied on the questionnaire on whether or not she had been the victim of a crime. It came out that this juror had, in fact, been involved in a crime, specifically a domestic violence crime, while she was pregnant. The other question I'd like to cover in terms of the jury misconduct burden, Your Honor, uh, is question 74. That was the question that asks, have you or any close friends or any relatives been the victim or witness of a crime. She, Kinsey, kicked in the front door of your house. Is that correct? Answer, she did. Question, did you consider that to be a crime? Answer, yeah, sure. So it, it was a crime, and it was a crime against her, uh, and she's admitted it. And yet, uh, in the questionnaire, when asked, have you ever been the victim of a crime? She said no. The question is, is, is she the victim of a stalking? And I think, again, Ms. Nice has told us that she was. Uh, and this is, a, a, I think, page 57 of the transcript. Do you consider her stalking you to be a crime? Answer, sure. So we, we can debate it, but Ms. Nice didn't debate it. She was the victim of stalking. So on November 2nd, 2001, police arrived at Ms. Uh, nice's house late in the evening. Mr. Whiteside is arrested and charged with five crimes. He's charged with battery on a spouse, corporal injury to a spouse, false imprisonment, endangering the health uh, of a child, cruelty to a child, and simple battery. We know from the remaining exhibits that in fact uh, he pleads guilty, he pleads guilty to battery and the other charges are dismissed. And we know he's ordered to serve, I think, uh, 10 days in county and 104 hours of domestic violence counseling. So we have that version told by the documents. Ms. Nice has come into court 22 years after the, 21 years after the incident and said that in fact, those documents are wrong. There was no domestic violence. Mr. Whiteside is charged with endangering the health of a baby, cruelty to a baby. 
there's no scenario under which, or that I can think of, under which Ms. Nice's 2022 version of events accounts for that charge. Police didn't just make, they don't just make up charges. They base it on the evidence from their investigation. So I don't believe her current version of what happened accounts for the fact that police charged the, the case the way they did. I just think it, they're irreconcilable. In 2000, Ms. Nice filled out that paperwork in connection with her restraining order. And here's what she said about whether she was in fear for her baby's life. This is what she said under oath in the paperwork in 2000. Michelle does not want Marcella to be able to come anywhere near her after it, her child after it is born. Michelle feels Marcella will try to hurt the baby with all the hate and anger she has for Michelle. That was under oath in 2000. Here's what Ms. Nice said under oath in 2022 about whether she had fear for her baby. This is Mr. Pat Harris. Okay, did you have a genuine fear that she was going to hurt your child? Nope. You never were afraid of that. Nope. But there's a chasm between those two, both under oath. However, the judge determined that despite all of that, there was no evidence to support that juror number seven actually knowingly committed misconduct during jury selection, and she denied Scott's request for a new trial. The judge wrote of her decision, quote, the court concludes that juror number seven's responses were not motivated by pre-existing or improper bias against Peterson, but instead were the result of a combination of good faith and misunderstanding of the questions and sloppiness in answering, end quote. Now, the number two key issue that needs to be addressed is a new evidence claim where someone gave details about the Medina burglary, Lacey's abduction, and Lacey's murder. Now, this one is crazy, and it's one I had never heard before I actually started reading more into the case and reading the trial transcripts, but get this. Just days after Lacey was reported missing, a neighbor went to police to say she witnessed a strange van parked across the street from Scott and Lacey's house on Christmas Eve, the day she went missing. And the witness said she thought it was odd that three men were dragging a safe across somebody's front lawn on Christmas Eve. It would later be confirmed that a burglary did in fact occur directly across the street at the Medinas, who were the neighbors of Lacey and Scott on Christmas Eve. We had a burglary that was reported to have occurred uh, directly across the street from the residence in question here on Christmas Eve morning. And when I went by uh, Medina's house, I saw people on the lawn in a van. I noticed it because they all turned around and looked at me. Now, police eventually tracked down these burglars who were identified as Stephen Todd and Donald Pierce. And the first statements the suspects made, apparently, were that they had nothing to do with the disappearance of that woman. We received a, a tip yesterday that led us to some suspects in the burglary case. We have two people in custody. When he picked up the safe and took it to my house, and that's all that I had to do with it. I didn't have nothing to do with the... That is disappearance. They told the police they burglarized the house on the 26th, which in retrospect, if you look at it, doesn't really make a lot of sense because we know that the street was already crawling with law enforcement, FBI, and media all hours of the day after Lacey went missing on the 24th. We solved that burglary, found out that it in fact occurred on the 26th was when the home was broken into. This is a separate incident altogether. It's confident in our minds that we now we have one crime that we can resolve and now focus our, our attention back on uh, finding Lacey Peterson. After I talked to the policeman and gave him my statement that I had seen the dog in the park, nothing was followed up. There's at least 11 witnesses that saw Lacey that day. This is all while Scott's at the office on his computer. I wasn't the last one to see Lacey that day. There are so many witnesses. We saw her walk in the neighborhood after I left. The cops just never followed up on the burglar across the street. The police failed to find my family. Now, fast forward to today. The petition is claiming that someone with the initials of DM made comments at a gathering last year that he was personally involved in the burglary that occurred across the street from Lacey and Scott's home the very same morning that Lacey disappeared. Three witnesses 
at this gathering heard this DM person say, she threatened to call the police and we couldn't get caught. We had to shut her up. DM claimed that he was there when the men abducted Lacey, but he did not have anything to do with her murder. One of the witnesses didn't want to get any further involved in the case, so she dropped out of it. However, the two other witnesses have both signed declarations and their full names are under seal right now with the court. Now, these witnesses gave information to the investigators and that information actually happens to be specific details that were never made public about the case. So that is super weird. And what is this secret information that hasn't been made public that they overheard? Like, I'm so curious to know that. But it's all under seal at the moment, so it will be interesting to keep an eye on this claim to see what else comes out about it. The number three issue is again involving the burglary and a claim that the district attorney presented false evidence and argument by claiming the Medina burglary did not occur on December 24th, despite the fact that they had a witness say she saw the burglary and she was sure it was on the 24th, and the fact that media claimed they were sitting on the street ever since Lacey's disappearance, even overnight. They now say the burglary took place on December 26th, not December 24th. The problem with that is, I was standing outside that house at five in the morning on December 26th. And I would have gone and interviewed the burglars if they were out there because there was nobody outside the front of that house. My head was on a swivel that morning and there is absolutely no way a burglary took place on December 26th during those early morning hours. Nowhere to be found. The police theory was completely inconsistent with what Diane Jackson, the eyewitness to the burglary, had seen. Do you remember talking to Diane Jackson? No, I don't, I don't remember that name, but if I did, it would have had to have been documented. It is documented. Oh, it is? Yeah. Well, there you go. Yeah, Where's... I have it in front of me. Oh, OK. Yeah. The police report indicated that we spoke to Diane Jackson on the 27th. She witnessed a burglary at 11.40 AM on the 24th of December. And then there's Ed Steele right there. So it's safe to say that if the burglary that happened across the street occurred on the 24th, it would have been extremely relevant to this case. Certainly. In my opinion, it would be. Personally, I do kind of find it hard to believe. I mean, even the dumbest burglar would know better than to commit a crime across the street from where another crime had just occurred. I mean, that place was already crawling with detectives, FBI, and media from two days before. Now, moving on to claim number four is that the Modesto Police Department is suppressing exculpatory evidence in violation of Brady versus Maryland in conjunction with the Aponte tip. Now, this one really creeps me out. And first of all, for those of you who don't know, I didn't know either, I had to look it up. Brady versus Maryland was a landmark US Supreme Court case, which established that the prosecution must turn over all evidence, even if it might help exonerate the defendant. So the number four claim is that the police department knowingly suppressed evidence about the burglary. What evidence, you ask? Well, just weeks after Lacey's disappearance, a man named Lieutenant Aponte was working his job in the investigators unit at the California Rehabilitation Institute in Los Angeles, and he overheard a recorded conversation between inmate Adam Tenbrink and his brother Sean Tenbrink about the burglary. They were caught red-handed by the neighbor, a woman, and that one of the men, Stephen Todd, had made a verbal threat to her. Side note, it is well documented that Lacey was a pretty confrontational person. So a lot of people make the argument what kind of pregnant woman would confront, you know, a burglary in action. But it was pretty well documented during trial that Lacey, um, if she was the type of person, if she saw something going down that shouldn't be going down, she would get involved in it. She had been writing letters to the township complaining that there was poor lighting in the parks. There was a big transient problem. And actually a few weeks prior, it was said that she broke up a fight in the middle of the street uh, between two transients. And a judge who was a neighbor of hers actually warned her not to get so 
you know, involved in these altercations because it's kind of inflammatory and, you know, she's a pregnant woman to stay out of it. But Lacey was just a very confrontational, strong woman. So it is something I can see happening based on the evidence that I've read about at trial. If Lacey saw something, in my mind, her personality would be to put her nose in it. So it was said that this Stephen Todd had made a verbal threat to her. That is what this lieutenant overheard on the phone. Now, Lieutenant Aponte immediately called the Modesto Police Department to say he had this evidence, but he never got called back, so he called back multiple times. A couple of weeks before the trial was over, we received a letter from an inmate in the Modesto County Jail. We referred to him as Mr. R. And he mentioned a couple of names, specifically Sean Tinbrink. So we typed in the names, and lo and behold, we hit on a Lieutenant Aponte, who was a watch commander at a state prison. A few weeks after Lacey disappeared, he had sent a tip in to the Modesto police. Sean Timbrink, who was in prison, was having a conversation on the phone with his brother, Adam, who is a close friend of Stephen Todd, who did the burglary. Adam said, Stephen had told him, Lacey went across the street, confronted them during the burglary, and they threatened her. And when Lacey's name came up, Sean Tenbrink started screaming at the brothers, shut up, shut up, this could be monitored, we're not gonna talk about that. Lieutenant Aponte then said that he gave the Modesto police a copy of the tape. Modesto says that no police officer went, and they don't have a copy of the tape. So where is the cassette tape, and why didn't Modesto Police Department enter it under a chain of command in their evidence? Who was it that called Lieutenant Aponte back? I have answers to that. It's baffling. This tip exculpated Scott. It tended to show that somebody else knew something about a burglary in the neighborhood and that that burglary in the neighborhood had a connection to Lacey Peterson. When I find most weird, though, even though most recordings at the prison are kept for a long period of time, in this particular case, all recordings were deleted. Yep. Soon after the investigation, the prison decided to upgrade their recording system and apparently all of the previous recordings got completely deleted during the switch. So no known tapes of this conversation exist. And sadly, Lacey's body was discovered four months later washed up on the shore of San Francisco Bay, which is where police announced to the media pretty early on that Scott had been the day that Lacey disappeared. We appreciate very much your attention to this incident. Lacey was last seen by her husband, Scott, when she was walking her dog possibly in the area of East La Loma Park, Dry Creek. During the day before Christmas, her husband was fishing in the Bay Area. There were suspicions that were brewing about Scott based on his alibi that he'd gone to the Berkeley Marina for the day. Chief, was Scott fishing by himself? Or was he with someone in Berkeley? We're not gonna, we're not gonna discuss that at this point. The fifth claim in his appeal is actually more of a request that counsel be assigned to review the evolving science of fetal development to show that the state presented false evidence about Connor's date of death. Now, one of the bigger issues at the trial is that the coroner who performed on the fetus established that its age of death was about nine months or full term. But a forensic anthropologist testified that the fetus's age was between 33 and 38 weeks. The age of the baby at the time of death is critical because if you could determine that the baby had lived, say, a couple days longer than that, it would dispute everything the prosecution had said about when Scott had killed the baby. The prosecution had a doctor that testified, and he said Connor's date of death was December 24th. The defense criticized Dr. Gregory DeVore, the state's expert. Dr. DeVore's testimony is based on what's called fetal development. 
And there are formulas that allow you to measure the bones of a fetus and it'll tell you exactly uh, how old the fetus is and when the fetus stopped growing. And so Dr. DeVore takes a formula that was developed by one of the foremost experts in the world, a doctor named Philippe Chante, and he reaches a conclusion, remarkably enough, that Connor stopped growing on December 24th. And that is exactly what the prosecution wanted. The problem with Dr. DeVore, in a nutshell, he used the wrong formula, he measured the wrong bones, and he came out with the wrong result. The habeas lawyers for Scott Peterson contacted Dr. Jean T, and Dr. Jean T himself completely unraveled the prosecution witness testimony. Dr. DeVore measured the wrong bones. You should measure two or three of the bones, so not just the femur, but the humerus and the tibia as well. When Dr. Jean T used his own formula and used the average of the three bones, he concluded that Connor lived well past December 24th and may have been alive as late as January 3rd. Now, that's very different from the December 24th date that Dr. DeVore concluded. Since that is a fairly big difference, they are wanting to have another look at the fetal development evidence. Finally, the sixth claim is a cumulative, I can barely say that word, claim, in which I'm assuming is the overall idea that Scott should have had the constitutional right to a fair trial. So those are the six issues that the state has less than 30 days now to address. At this point, Scott does not have any attorneys. Because he's no longer on death row, he would have to either represent himself or hire an attorney, which we know he doesn't have the money for. So he's representing himself. But I did hear that his sister-in-law, Janie, who has strongly maintained his innocence uh, from day one, has just passed the bar as of May 5th, I think. So she might be aiding him in this fight. And at this point, it's been 20 20 years since Lacey went missing, and Scott's death penalty sentence was recently overturned. Scott's direct appeal resulted in his death sentence being overturned by the California Supreme Court because they found that some jurors were inappropriately dismissed when they said they did not agree with the death penalty. So what do you think of these six issues? Do you think there's any truth to these claims? How do you think the state's going to respond to this? Again, the court has given the state just 30 days to respond to this appeal, so we should hear something really by the end of May at this point. And that's really all I have for now, just that quick update. So I will keep you updated on the outcome of all of that, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much for watching. Bye!